Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. I'm George Grishin speaking with you about Denia, Valencia, Spain, about its history and modern days. We are in the 14th century today, 1300s. And we're going to speak about two Pedros, the kings of Castilla and Aragon, the new king of Castilla, Henry of Trastamara, and our Don Alfonso. We'll be talking about ceremonies and palaces, about monasteries, bats and dragons. And um, I suggest uh, to split the century in two parts. We'll first be looking at the general picture and at Valencia. And then in the second part, we'll be speaking about our part of uh, Valenciana, Denia, Gandia, and so on and so forth. So the main points will be, first of all, how important Mercia and Alicante were for both Castilla and Aragon, or Valencia. And we have to speak about Pedro IV, or Peter IV, ceremonious and his life, about how he was dancing in the night with his queen in the royal palace in Valencia. We'll speak about his wars with um, everyone, with Genoa, with Mallorca, with Castilla, and how uh, big and important uh, the event of plague was happening in 1348. We'll speak about the Castilian Civil War, 1350-1369, and the War of Do uh, Dos Pedros, two Peters, 1356-69, between Castilla and Aragon. Why it occurred, where it was um, uh, developing, and so forth. We'll speak about the Spanish uh, new dynasty Trastamara, first of all, the dynasty in Castilla, about uh, Valencia and how loyal it was to King Pedro IV of Aragon. And then we'll speak about Denia, how it became to be owned by Infantes and uh, who was Don Alfonso El Viejo. All right, let's begin with general outlook of history and the dynasty called Trastamara. It started in this century we're talking about, in the 14th century, exactly in the year of 1369. It started with Henry or Enrique de Trastamara. Actually, Enrique um, was a bastard king of the previous, uh, the bastard son, I'm sorry, of the previous king. He took the surname Trastamara from his uncle. And actually Trastamara means across the river Tambra or Tamares a river which is situated in the present-day Galicia. The dynasty of Trastamara was um, ruling Castilla between 1369 and 1516. And it was also ruling Aragon. Yes, the same dynasty in two different kingdoms. And it was ruling Aragon from 1412 also to 1516. The dynasties got married in the Catholic kings, but then we have to talk about 15th century. At the moment, we are still in century 14, number 14, in 1300s, but that was when the dynasty of Trastamara started. So we have to find out everything about Castilla and Aragon. Why Trastamara? Okay, the overall look at uh, the century, the most important event was, of course, the plague. 1348, which killed half of population. And see how it was uh, developing. It started in Crimea, then on a ship, a uh, diseased uh, body of a diseased person who was also, uh, who was having plague, uh, the body was carried to Italy. And then from Italy, it spread all over Europe. Half of the population, European population died. And of course, it also, caused rebellions later, 10 years, 20 years later after the plague, because there were too few uh, peasants, too few laborers, and they were demanding higher salaries. Okay, also important, this century, 1326, fire arms arrived in Europe, uh, in Florence to start with. The other thing, Aragon was moving overseas. Aragon started here and then it got itself Sardinia, Sicily, and even Athens for a while. Would you imagine the huge push of Aragon overseas, 14th century. 
And of course, problems between Castilla and Aragon. We'll be speaking about Mercia. Mercia was very, very strategically located here. And we'll have to speak about it a bit later. First things first, yes, there were quite a few kings, but um, I can't speak about all the kings. You remember, 13th century, the previous century, 1200s, the most important king was Jaume the first, Jaume the first, James the first, the conqueror. For us, in the 14th century, Peter the fourth or Pedro the uh, the fourth was important. First of all, he was a king for 51 years, between 1336 and 87, and um, he was called Pedro the fourth of Aragon, el ceremonioso, the ceremonious, or del puñalet, with a dagger. Allegedly, he was carry, uh, carrying his killing dagger with him, although he is not quite well known for killing people personally. Anyway, because he was moving overseas, not only he was a king of Aragon, he was also, of course, the king of Valencia, not as fourth, but as second, Pedro II. He was king of Sardinia and Corsica, Pedro I. He was count of Barcelona, and also in 1344, he deposed James II of Mallorca, Jaume II. The thing is that uh, there was a separate kingdom of Mallorca only for 70 years, between 1270s and 1340s. Uh, yes, it was related to the Aragonese the dynasty, but it was a separate kingdom. And during the times of Pedro IV, the kingdom of Mallorca came back to the kingdom of Aragon. Wars, lots of wars. When Pedro IV became a king, uh, there was a war between Aragon and Genoa. Of course, they were all interested in Mediterranean. They were all willing, the both countries, uh, Aragon and Genoa, it was a separate uh, maritime republic. They were willing to dominate, first of all, the Eastern Mediterranean, because that was the place where all riches from the East, spices, silk, were coming. So whoever was the master of Eastern Mediterranean was the master of lots of uh, riches. So the uh, war was uh, going on for six years. And uh, well, sort of Aragon won, but not greatly. Then there was a war in Mallorca for eight years, 1341-49. And at the end of the war, James II, Jaume II was decapitated. His head was cut off and uh, he was, uh, buried in the cathedral of valencia why so that in mallorca itself his burial place wouldn't become you know a place of um, um the important place for those who were on his side so um this uh, decapitated body was buried in uh, the cathedral of valencia yeah i'm talking simultaneously with our little uh, bird here <laughs> a little um a little yellowish bird uh, how it thinks. Okay, so um, and um, the decapitated body of uh, Jaume II of Mallorca was kept in Cathedral of Valencia between 1348 and 1904 when it was reburied in Mallorca. All right, another war, Guerra de Union. It was actually a rebellion inside Aragon. We're going to talk about it. 1347-48. Still another war, Guerra de los dos Pedros, the two Peters war. 1356-69, another 13 years. So lots of things happened uh, during the times of Peter the Fourth, Peter the Fourth. Um, for instance, Athens belonged to Aragon. And what uh, he did, he actually put 11 ballesteros, the shooters for Marbalet, uh, shotgun, um, to guard Acropolis in Athens because he was saying that it was the most beautiful building in the whole world. So he was quite a cultural king. And now, but well, cultural, yes, cultural, but uh, he still had to deal with all those wars. And in Valencia, when he was coming to Valencia, it is important to stress that the courts of the medieval evil kings and queens were all itinerant, they were all moving. They didn't have a particular palace to stay, but uh, they were staying in one place for some time, in another place for some time. There are lots of theories and 
practical ideas why it was happening. But anyway, uh, Aragon itself had three major centers. Aragon, the capital of Saragossa, Saragossa, then the county of Barcelona, and of course Barcelona being capital, and Kingdom of Valencia. Then, of course, Aragon uh, got itself Mallorca with Palma de Mallorca and so on and so forth. So in Valencia, there was the beautiful place called Palacio del Real, the Royal Palace. It was on the same place since Moorish times. And actually it was interesting, it was outside the town of Valencia. See, the town of the city of Valencia is here. Then there was Turia River, which is now a big, long garden, a fantastic little garden. And the place of the royal palace was here from Arab times because, uh, well, it was a big garden. There was uh, a pond, so lots of water, lots of plants, nice place. And the palace existed. It was well, built during, um, it was started to be built uh, during Jaime the first times in 1240s. Then it was, of course, uh, destroyed or damaged during the War of Dos Pedros then rebuilt and was existing in this beautiful uh, view for quite a few centuries later on. And finally it was uh, destroyed during the war with Napoleon or the independence war in 1810 because uh, Valencia three times was besieged by French, um, French troops. And in order for the palace not to get into their hands, the Valencianos themselves uh, destroyed the palace. And you can see the little, little hill in the uh, uh, royal garden behind the Turia now. And this is the place where the palace, uh, Palacio del Real, the royal palace was existing for hmm, at least thousand years. Now, Guerra de Union, what was it, Guerra de Union? It was a rebellion of unions of Valencia and unions of Aragon against Pedro IV. Why? First of all, they wanted more rights. They wanted less taxes and also the problem was that at that time, Pedro IV didn't have a male heir. So he appointed his daughter as an heiress, but it was against all traditions. So they didn't want this. Um, there were a number of battles. Some of the battles Pedro IV lost, but then finally he won the Battle of Epidia in 1348. And also the plague came to Valencia lands. So the Guerra de Union models finished. But an interesting episode uh, took place in April 1348 in Easter. Uh, at that time, King and Queen didn't have too many troops. They were staying in Palacio Real. And during nighttime, the rebels came to the palace, brought their own musicians who were playing well, rather sarcastic or satirical tunes. And they got the King and Queen of their bedrooms, or one bedroom, I don't know, and in uh, their night robes, uh, they had to dance, to dance for the rebels, my gosh. Uh, the king was not amused. He did remember this episode for years and years, and this episode actually can be uh, read about in lots of um, stories about Valencia. So April 1348, when Valencians made king a queen dance to their tunes. Well, in spite of this episode, Pedro IV was always staying in Palacio del Real, always. Not only him, all other kings and queens after him. And when it was destroyed in 1350s, he was asking the city council to rebuild it as soon as possible. Um, because he was saying, look, if you rebuild my beloved palace, I'll be coming to see Valencia more often. And you know perfectly well that the entrance of the king to Valencia and also Corpus Christi are the two most important holidays or fiestas in the Valencian calendar. So they have, uh, you know, artificial fires, dancing in the street, music and lots of money spent, of course. So the city council was doing a lot to have the Palacio del Real rebuilt as quick as possible. 1340s we're talking about. Now, let's switch on to Castilla, the other kingdom. Why it is important for us? Because of that new dynasty. See, Alfonso XI had lots of children. His senior son, the legal son, became 
the king of Castilla, Pedro was first called just, justiciero, but then he was called cruel, cruel, el cruel. Well, some people are saying that he, he is here in uh, Prada, oh, I'm sorry, in the um, archaeological museum in uh, Madrid. Some people are saying, uh, some scientists are saying that he had his brain damaged. So he didn't feel that he was that cruel. Anyway, he was cruel. And his half-brother, Enrique de Trastamara, started a war against him. And the half-brother was, was an illegal uh, son, a bastard. So the most of Europe split because it was also the time of 100 years war between England and France. England was on the side of Pedro I, the legal king. Not only England, the famous English Black Prince. Black Prince, Edward, was called the most sort of like the epitome of chivalry. He was the knight of the knights. And when Pedro I sent to him for help and actually came and met him uh, in France, asking him to help him, uh, Edward, the Black Prince, said, Yeah, well, I'm don't do want to support you because uh, you know an illegal son a bastard cannot occupy a throne so what happened was uh, pedro the first promised uh, to pay lots of money to black prince black prince got a great a very big army oh by then time by that uh, times so, all well, the estimates are between 10000 and 80000 persons he came to spain uh, all against the promises to pay by uh, Pedro the Cruel. And he won a very important battle of Najera against Enrique de Trastamara, against Henry of Trastamara in April 1367. He won it, yeah. He got lots of uh, prisoners uh, from the other side and also from Aragon because Aragon and France were supporting uh, Enrique de Trastamara, the illegal son, the bastard. So the Battle of Najera was won, but the problem was that Pedro the Cruel never kept his word, never paid a single pound or a florin or whatever to Edward, the Black Prince. The British, the English uh, armies, the English knights spent a whole cruel summer of 1347, uh, of 1367, excuse me, um, near Valladolid, lots of them died. First of all, of dysentery, there was no food, there was no water. And uh, the Black Prince actually got himself ill um, and he died eight years later, but uh, they're saying that uh, that stay during summer in Spain was one of the reasons he got his health, well, that his health deteriorated. So having received no money from Pedro the Cruel, uh, the Black Prince left Spain. And, well, Enrique's uh, reputation, in spite of the fact that he lost the battle of Najera, started improving. Because, after all, he was fighting the, you know, fleur of, well, uh, the creme de la creme of uh, the English and Castilian uh, knighthood. And he himself escaped. He got away. Yes, all his uh, uh, soldiers, all his knights actually got into prison, uh, got in, uh, and had to, you know, buy themselves out to buy a, to pay a ransom. But he himself escaped. Two years later, uh, he, with the help of French, uh, there was a, a general, let's say, Du Gusculin, big, big person, physically uh, strong. He was on the side of Enrique de Trastamara. And what happened, uh, he actually, during the battle, which Enrique's and French troops were we, uh, winning against the troops of Pedro el Cruel, Dugas Quillen got to Pedro, told him that he would help him escape from the battlefield, but actually led him straight to the tent of Enrique de Trastamara, Henry de Trastamara. And being very, very strong physically, the French, Dusquilin, got the king, the real king, Pedro el Cruel, from his horse 
And then Henry the Trastamara killed with his dagger his own half brother. That's why, of course, he was called Fratisida, the brother killer. But not only he killed him, his he, he, uh, the king was beheaded. See, this uh, painting said, uh, yes, the king's uh, head was put on a spike. Awful, 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 I know. But that's how dynasty of Trastamara started, 1369. But going back, history, we have to speak about uh, the War of Two Peters, the yet not uh, dead uh, Pedro the First, Peter the First, cruel, and our Pedro, Peter the Fourth, ceremonious of Aragon. And you know what the war was about, which actually lasted for thirteen years, fifty-six to sixty-nine. The war was all about Murcia or Mercia and Alicante. The question was always whether they are Castilian or Aragonese. Castilla had a huge fleet in the Atlantic. But the sea to be in the 14th century, I mean, in the 15th century, was Mediterranean. And Murcia was the only connection of Castilla with Mediterranean because that part was still Muslim and that part was um, Aragonese, Valencia. So, of course, it was very, very important for Castilla to have Murcia. Murcia, for instance, has Cartagena the famous port even now. And um, that's so relevant that actually, actually these lands were split between Castilla and uh, Valencia or Aragon when they were still Muslim. The first treaty to split, uh, to separate these lands was uh, signed in 1179. 60 years before these, all these lands were conquered or reconquered by Christians. And it was agreed that what was then Taifa de Murcia, the Muslim Taifa de Murcia would go to Aragon, and what was then the Taifa de Valencia would go to, I'm sorry, Taifa de Valencia goes to Aragon and Taifa de Murcia goes to Castilla here, right? Nice and simple. So Castilla gets access to Mediterranean. That's important. But 1266, Muslims uh, uh, spark a rebellion, and the Valencian Jaime I moves into Murcia in order to suppress the rebellion, helping Castilla. These places remain Castilian until 1296. Jaime II of Aragon at that time occupied the whole Murcia helping Alfonso de la Cerda. De la Cerda is a very important uh, family, um, was a very important family in the whole of Spain for at least 500 years. And at that time, Alfonso de la Cerda had a claim on the whole Castilian throne. Jaime II decided to help him. He occupied the whole of Murcia in 1296, and under the treaty signed in 1304, he got Alicante. So Alicante, originally, after the Reconquista, was completely Castilian between 1248 and 1296. And from 1296, Alicante became part of Aragon or part of the Kingdom of Valencia, which is the same thing. Well, did Castilla like it? Not very much. Because, of course, Alicante by that time was quite a big port with fantastic... Uh, castle on the on top of the hill, Santa Barbara castle, which you can always visit, of course. So um, yeah, the war between two Peters was really the war for Alicante. And it was uh, in our places, in our region, between Alicante, Calpe, Denia, and Valencia. Calpe and Valencia being the Aragonese, the Valencian uh, places were completely devastated by Castilian troops because Castilian troops first were taking on uh, the upper hand. They were winning for about uh, at least eight first years in the war. Uh, they also had Genovese, Genova, supporting them with their mighty fleet. The Aragon fleet was much smaller. So, the, for instance, the Genovese burned down Calpe, our neighboring town not far away from here. 
and uh, Denia had um, a Castilian governor. So um, as far as Pedro the Aragonese, Pedro the Fourth was concerned, Denia and Calpe were traitors. Meanwhile, Valencia stayed on the side of Aragon, supported Pedro the Fourth against Pedro the First cruel, and there were two sieges of Valencia, 1363, 1364. In both of them, Valencia stood strong, remained loyal to Pedro the Fourth, and this is why we have two L's in the coat of on the coat of arms of Valencia. Well, the war finished in 1369. You know why? Because the main protagonist, uh, Pedro the First Cruel of Castilla, was decapitated by his half brother. So the war ended indecisively. But uh, anyway, Alicante was still stayed part of Aragon, part of the Kingdom of Valencia, whilst Murcia, of course, stayed uh, in Castilla, in Castilla. And um, this is where the, all the symbols of Valencia come from, from that century. Pedro the Fourth Ceremonioso gave this as gifts to Valencia somewhere around 1377. What did he give to Valencia? First, these two letters L, and we now know where these two letters L come from. They were double uh, lealissima leal, twice time loyal to Pedro the Fourth in 1363 and in 1364. Then, of course, this bat, Murcia Lago, as it's called, or uh, Lerat Penal, when came to the um, coat of arms, well, the story, of course, is uh, connected to Jaime, Jaime the I and his reconquering of Valencia in 1238, but it was placed on the coat of arms during Pedro the Fourth times, right? Actually, on top of the crown. And to give a crown to a city was very, very important. Valencia got its flag, Bandera Real, or it's called Sinjera. Sinjera is the name for flag in Valenciano. And this flag, here it is, has the stripes of Aragon, yellow and red, and it has the crowns on blue, and also a little bit of green, green so it's got five colors, uh, the flag. And uh, if uh, a true Valenciana wants to just stress that he is, uh, um, well, he's supporting the Valencian kingdom, uh, he's always saying, I'm on the uh, right of the blues, of the blouse, okay? So that's, we know where the blue and the crown came from, from uh, Pedro the Fourth Ceremoniosa. And you know what? The flag itself is now kept in the mayor's office of Valencia, in El Ayuntamiento in Valencia. You can see it, first of all, on 9th October, the national holiday of Valencia. And uh, because it's a royal flag, Sinjera Real, Sinjera Coronada, the tradition is, it, uh, is that it cannot be bent. See, again, um, in front of anyone except for God. So it's always carried absolutely straight. See, and it is kept as absolutely straight under these guards in the Ayuntamiento of Valencia. Once again, this is the crowned flag of Valencia. And also the Escuda. The coat of arms of uh, Valencia, uh, they were given by, uh, again, by Pedro the Ceremoniosa, he, he is. And uh, they have the dragon. Sometimes people are saying it was just uh, an alliteration. Drago Aragon, just to stress that the Valencian kingdom was part of the crown of Aragon. Some people are saying it is not a dragon, it is a La Cimera, Chimera. Okay, it doesn't really matter, but it's now the coat of arms of the whole Valencian community, Comunidad Valenciana, the dragon given by um, uh, Pedro IV, the helmet, and uh, the shield with Aragonese colors. And what did we also get? What did Valencia also get uh, during these wars? It was interesting that the two sieges, 1363, 1364, were when Valencia still had its Arab walls. Here they are, the red ones. 
The very original walls, the yellow walls, were dur built during Roman times. Then during Arab times, there were these red walls, but they were not really very strengthened. In spite of this, Valencia managed to uh, withhold two sieges. And only after the war, in 1356, did Valencia start building the big wall. It's a very big area here. Here we had Re, uh, River Turia, which is now a big, big garden. And Valencia was one of the largest cities in Europe altogether. They're saying that after the um, 1348 lake, uh, the population went down to 40,000, but uh, by the year 1500, that was 80,000. That was a lot, believe me. And so the walls of Valencia were built in uh, between 1356 and 1370. And one of the most important towers, Torres de Serranos, was built a little bit later. But again, the idea was uh, uh, to build them was, uh, well, uh, came to uh, world during the times of Pedro IV. But they, uh, the um, uh, gates were actually built in 1392-98. And you can see them at all maps or drawings of Valencia. You can see them now. There is a museum inside really a strong. Serranos um, is actually a little settlement uh, not far from Valencia, but these were the gates uh, looking to the north, and through them all big important visitors to Valencia were coming, including 22 kings of uh, Aragon and uh, Spain uh, who passed under them starting from 1404. At some point of time, there was a prison there, and also during uh, the war uh, of 1936-39, uh, Valencia was actually the capital of Republicans, and all the precious paintings from Prada were kept in uh, Las Torres de Serranos. But again, we know that they were built during that same 14th century we have been talking about. Thank you very much. It was George Grishan with you speaking about the history of Valencia and Spain altogether. The second part of this uh, will be much, much shorter. We'll be speaking about Don Alfonso and uh, the county of Denia. Thanks a lot. Bye.